In our cities and in our homes, we surround ourselves with a very sanitized version of nature. Nature is fine if it's safe, if it's harmless. These charming inhabitants of the Kalahari Desert live together in close family groups. We can't live without nature. We are a part of it. So we divide the world into creatures we like and creatures we don't like. Into the good, the bad, and sometimes the ugly. But nature doesn't hold such prejudice. We may not like cockroaches, but they like us, and they have done for thousands of years. Wherever and whenever humans stockpiled food, roaches were there to share it. And there isn't much we can do about it. On a cockroach's tail, tiny hairs vibrate with the slightest air current, warning of approaching danger. And in a flash, they're gone. large numbers, cockroaches create a disgusting smell, another deterrent to anything that could threaten them. But when nature invades our space without our permission, we declare war. The first plan of attack is simply to bait the cockroach into a sticky fluid. It's caught fast. Simple, but effective. But our warm, comfortable homes are a haven for other unwelcome guests. Brown rats, much more recent companions than roaches, joined us from the Near East in the 17th century to exploit our food supplies. And house mice, smaller, able to live in spaces the rats can't reach. Yet not all swarms make our flesh crawl. Our relationship with honeybees is almost as old as that with roaches. To some ancient cultures, honeybees were sacred, and in other cultures, they were domesticated. Either way, we exploit this swarm. Bees make and store honey to keep the colony alive through the winter. Bringing in this stockpile of food is the worker bee's most important job, and it's hard work. Many workers die every day from exhaustion. We've learned to control honeybees using smoke to calm them, subdue them, making them docile and less likely to sting. And then we steal their honey.
There was a time when honey was the only way we could indulge our taste for sweet things. It has medicinal properties and was used as a preservative. But just as we exploit the honeybee's hard work, other swarms are even more efficient at exploiting ours. Nothing can compare to the unimaginable size of a vast swarm. Locusts sweeping across the land in a huge swing, covering a thousand square kilometers. Every 10 to 15 years or so, conditions alter in the environment. The coming of the rains or a change in temperature trigger this massive migration. Millions of locusts take to the air each day, eating their own body weight in the green shoots of our well-tended crop. A swarm so immense can devour as much as the entire population of New York eats every day. A biblical plague. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. This swarm thrives simply because of our hard work. We cultivate our crops, providing a perfect food supply for the swarm as it passes through. The best we can do is to try to spray the locusts before they reach the next farm. But we're fighting a losing battle, in the field as well as in the home. Brown rats can afford to sit back and wait. Our obsession with cleanliness sends plenty of food their way. Rats eat almost anything, but any new food must be tested. They sample a tiny amount and then wait. If and only if it doesn't make them ill, they'll eat more of it. Rats, being so particular, are very hard to exterminate. Sometimes they try out a tiny amount of rat poison, reject it as dangerous, and leave it alone. But not all animals are so careful about what they eat. In creating clean, comfortable homes, we also create an underworld, a place below our cities we don't stop to think about. Deep in the sewers, rats live and multiply. It's a wonderful nursery, warm, safe, with no shortage of food. 
A rat can breed up to seven times a year, each time bringing as many as 20 babies into the world. Rats sometimes live in groups, swarms, of 50 or more, all descended from one female. In cities like New York or London, there are more rats than there are people. And there are more roaches than rats. Down here, cockroaches eat whatever they can find, and rats eat the cockroaches. A whole miniature ecosystem thrives beneath our feet. Out of our sight and out of our control, these hidden worlds are terrifying, the stuff of nightmares and horror movies. After the break, we present the all-time classic film, Alfred Hitchcock's thriller, The Birds. But first, the weather... Our you. view of nature is a mixture of fascination and fear. While we try to contain it and control it, we find its raw power disturbing. A bird in a cage becomes a pet, a symbol of our dominion over the natural world. But birds in huge numbers are very different. And depending on your point of view, they can be a spectacular display or a vision of terror. Red-winged blackbirds gather in huge flocks to feed. And at the end of the day, the flocks come together in massive roosts of up to 20 million birds. Unlike Hitchcock's vision of the birds, these blackbirds won't do us any direct harm, yet we still try to keep them out of the way of our homes. The birds must be moved on. Bird scarers scatter the flocks, sending them to roost somewhere else anywhere else. The problem is not that the birds destroy crops, but that they create a potential danger to our health. A flock this size produces huge amounts of droppings, which accumulate under the trees. 
A fungus that breeds naturally in the soil now runs riot and its spores can cause diseases. Despite the casualties of war, on the home front, the battle continues. And it's time to resort to modern technology, a space age zapper. Drawn into a special bait, the cockroaches climb into the zapper, close a circuit, and 6,000 volts send them to oblivion. But there are always more cockroaches. They're so good at keeping out of sight that to see one means that somewhere close by, hundreds more are hidden. And nature is the expert at recycling. The maze of sewers under our cities could have been designed as cockroach heaven. American cockroaches flourish here because we continually flush down food for them. They breed quickly. A female cockroach lays 16 eggs at a time and carries them around in a purse, keeping them safe until the tiny cockroaches are ready to hatch into the world. During her lifetime, a cockroach can breed 50 times, bringing 800 more cockroaches into the world. It takes 14 months for a cockroach to become fully grown, and it can easily live a further two years. Some sewers make very desirable residences. Under the plush hotels of London's Mayfair, so much warm water is flushed away that these sewers have become a tropical paradise for the American cockroach. Plenty of food rains down from above. Cockroaches, it seems, recognize quality when they see it. Yet in a less opulent part of London, a different class of waste is flushed down to the labyrinth below.
These sewers are supplied by bars and restaurants. Under Soho, instead of American cockroaches, there are Oriental cockroaches. Despite their name, Oriental roaches originally came from Africa, but they may have reached Europe from the Far East in shipments of food. But they soon established themselves as kings of the sewer. Their numbers grew and their populations reached titanic proportions. Cockroaches breed quickly, but not as quickly as the swarms of microbes that live in these depths. Every 20 minutes, these bacteria reproduce, doubling their numbers, and in the warm, damp underworld, create a living, breathing blob. As they feed and grow and divide, they exude hydrogen sulfide, the gas that smells of rotten eggs. As this gas drifts upwards, it's absorbed by different bacteria. And these bacteria turn the hydrogen sulfide gas into sulfuric acid. and sulfuric acid eats away at the mortar, holding the bricks in place. In separating ourselves from nature, we give some unfortunate creatures a reputation they don't deserve. Piranha alone are harmless, but in a swarm, they're killers. Or so we like to believe.
In the wet season, here in the flooded forest of the mighty Amazon, piranha live almost entirely on injured fish. This time of year, their fearsome reputation as killers is unfounded, a figment of our imaginations. They are drawn to the vibration and smell of their unfortunate prey already in its death throes, and here, in pictures never before filmed, these efficient fish quickly dispatch their victim, releasing it from a slow, painful death. Razor sharp teeth strip the flesh from the bones. Snipping the meat into small bite sized morsels, it can be easily swallowed. The teeth are arranged in the short, broad jaws. We divide nature into good and bad, for us or against us. And some that we see as bad is for good reason. It's part of our survival instinct a legacy of our evolution on the plains of East Africa. To be afraid of snakes was generally a good idea. Some snakes can do us serious harm. We don't always have time to think about it, so an instinctive reaction could keep us alive. also have an instinctive fear of some animals that are harmless. We are creatures of the daylight. And we fear them because they come from the darkness, from the night. Bats spend the daylight hours hidden in caves, emerging only as the sun goes down. and they gather in huge numbers, which also frightens us. But for these Mexican free-tailed bats, big numbers offer protection. A bat hawk simply waits for them to take to the air, then trawls through the flock. The more bats there are, the less likely that any one individual will be the unlucky one. And as the sun rises, they plunge back into the darkness. In the rush to get back, a few are knocked to the floor. There is no second chance. The floor is covered with cockroaches who waste no time tidying up. They are nature's refuse collectors, clearing away the debris, keeping the cave clean. But without such refuse collectors, the world would be a very unpleasant place. And now to other news, local manual workers have rejected the pay offer of 8.8% and are stepping up their industrial action. Now in its sixth week, the refuse collector strike is causing a serious build-up of rubbish left to rot in the streets. Officials are becoming concerned about the possible dangers to health. With no human refuse collectors, nature has a way of cleaning up the overflow. Decaying matter, 
food for voracious fly maggots. And flies breed at a phenomenal rate. More on the rubbish strike after the news and weather. But first, news of Middlesbrough's extraordinary 6 0 cup win over Bolton Wanderers. <laughs> If two flies bred at the start of the strike and all their offspring survived, by the sixth week there would be 30 million flies. And all these flies have one purpose, to make more flies. But flies live around organic waste, manure and rubbish, and each one of these flies carries millions of bacteria that spread disease. The spokesman argued that the health risks are being exaggerated and that there is no immediate danger of any outbreaks. Control measures are in place to stop the spread of vermin that could otherwise add to the health hazard. But when populations get too big, they spread out. Adult flies live entirely on sugar. Sugar, carbohydrate, is converted straight into energy. It's fast and efficient. So why isn't the world overrun by flies? Because the food isn't all theirs for the taking. Flies are in competition with other creatures, creatures that eat the same food and are not prepared to share it. A lot of food and the population grows. But as the population grows, there's less food to go round. Eventually, competition for food puts a natural limit on the size of a population. And where there's competition, sooner or later there will be direct conflict. It's only in unusual circumstances that flies build up in such huge numbers. At Mono Lake in California, the water is naturally salty, too salty for anything to live except the brine fly. Brine flies darken the shore of Mono Lake in countless millions. The adult flies feeding on algae in the water. This bizarre landscape. Mono Lake in California is a natural example of what happens when there's nothing to keep a population in check. This cornucopia of insects attracts millions of birds, offering them an easy and plentiful feast. Even the California gulls that come here to gorge themselves on the adult flies have little effect on their numbers. And with no fish in the salty water of the lake, the flies are not vulnerable to predators that might otherwise reduce the population. Be 
many as 4,000 flies per square foot on the shore. Two or three generations of brand flies hatch on the shores of the lake every year. But brand flies are harmless to humans, simply living out their lives in the warm desert climate, feeding, breeding with no other purpose than to make more brand flies. It is, after all, their territory. And the war against the cockroaches has little impact on their numbers. It's time to try a biological weapon. Hedgehogs are very partial to cockroaches and are now being imported to places where they don't normally occur. Not always with the desired result. Humans either intentionally or unintentionally, move animals around the world into places they were never meant to be. House mice hitched rides with humans, and when they arrive somewhere new, they simply adapt to new conditions. They've even been found living in industrial deep freeze storage rooms with extra fluffy coats to keep them warm. But if mice, or any creatures, are introduced somewhere with no natural predators, or not enough to control the numbers, then there is a population explosion, a plague. In Australia, the population of humble house mice has once again exploded, giving rise to a devastating plague that destroys crops and ruins livelihoods. Mice normally breed from October to April, but when conditions are right, they breed all year round, and this is the problem. In just six months, two mice can reproduce to become 2,000. They foul the hay, making it unusable, they gnaw through anything not made of metal, and they infest machinery which may even have to be repaired. And still, the cockroaches won't be beaten. Time to bring in the professionals. The cockroaches are besieged in their hiding places. Originally used to control termite infestations, liquid nitrogen literally freezes the roaches to death. Although cockroaches sometimes carry diseases, they mostly offend our sense of cleanliness, our pride in our neat, tidy homes. But lurking in the attic, 
is a swarm that has brought death and pestilence to much of the world. Black Rats Black rats are tree rats and are very agile. In houses where black rats and brown rats live together, black rats tend to live in the upper stories. But black rats carried the fleas that spread bubonic plague throughout Europe in the 14th century. They brought the black death. More than a third of the human population was wiped out. But bubonic plague isn't just a historical event, a disease of the Middle Ages. In India, more cases of bubonic plague are being reported every day in this recent outbreak. A campaign to eliminate the fleas that spread the disease is underway, and the Indian Red Cross is organizing the distribution of antibiotics in an attempt to check the spread of the plague. The key to its control may lie with the rats that are known to carry the fleas, and only a few places are known to have escaped the recent outbreak. Yet, even though they can carry disease, not all cultures see rats as evil, as creatures to be feared. To Hindus, life is sacred, all life, and rats are no exception. In the temple dedicated to the goddess Karni Mata, rats are revered as her reincarnated descendants, the Kabas. The temple rats are sacred. They never leave the temple, and rats from the outside world never intrude. They're fed on sweets, milk, and food offered to them by priests and pilgrims who want their blessing. Chapatis, specially made for the rats, are broken up for them by the Roti Baba, the holy man. The temple is in the town of Deshnoke, and despite the waves of bubonic plague that have broken out in India, Deshnoke has never had to suffer the disease. The town is blessed by Karni Mata and her Kabas, her rats. Back home, the cockroaches are still unbowed, undefeated. All that remains is to bring in the big gun, the newest technology in the war of cockroaches versus humans. Microwave weapons are being developed as a possible way to control roaches. The theory is that aiming beams of microwaves at the wall cavity where the cockroaches are holed up should simply cook them alive. But at certain microwave frequencies, the fluid inside a roach's body heats so quickly, it boils. With such a high-tech approach, curiosity and cats would not be a good combination.
Arizona, North America. And here we meet a swarm that seems to come from our worst nightmares. In our greed for honey, we've meddled with nature. African bees were imported into Brazil to increase the honey yield. But African bees were much too aggressive to be easily controlled by humans. Gradually, the bees migrated northwards across the Americas. Until now, these killer bees have reached Arizona and Texas. These bees fear nothing. They don't hold back from stinging and take a special dislike to anything dark. In their native Africa, Large mammals were a threat to their honey stores, so the bees had to be prepared to defend their nests viciously. Carbon dioxide from a mammal's breath was the signal to attack. As they attack the test balls, the stings are automatically counted. And within a matter of minutes, these small dark figures are covered in enough stings to kill a human. The swarm has turned. Killer bees are now a very real threat to human life in the southern United States. Even the vibrations and carbon dioxide from a lawnmower are interpreted as a threat. They attack without hesitation. only one way to fend off the assault. This is a swarm of our own creation. A result of our obsession with playing God. By interfering with the natural order of things, we create results we could never have expected. Our war against nature is never ending. Yet from nature's point of view, there is one swarm that has infested the whole planet. Humans. We number in our billions. Still growing, still spreading, taking control wherever we go. The ultimate swarm of all.